Sports. It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Friday, January 26th. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. We'll dig into maternal health in the North Country. The percentage of babies born at home in St. Lawrence County is almost 10 times the state average. And just one midwife delivers most of those babies. She knows me. She knows my name. And I trust her with everything in me. This winter's mild weather has caused unstable and dangerous ice on North Country's rivers and lakes. Emergency officials are warning people to be aware before going on the ice. Four inches is good for going out for ice fishing. And a snowmobile or ATV, it's recommended for five inches for a small car or pickup, eight to 12 inches. Also, music and conversation with the string duo Archai. They'll bring their electroacoustic brand of music to the Adirondacks this weekend. Jonathan and I are both naturally voracious omnivores of music, and we are very curious. That's what led us to be exploring musical styles outside of the classical tradition that we were studying at Juilliard. All of that and more is coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by the Depot Theater in Westport, inviting all to take a journey without leaving the station. Learn more at depotheater.org. And CECOM Credit Union, serving the financial needs of people throughout northern New York and northwestern Vermont, in person, online at CECOM.org and on your smartphone. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. Places to give birth in the North Country are few and far between. Expecting parents sometimes drive hours to reach a hospital. And some parents want to avoid hospitals. Instead, they choose to have their babies at home. The home birth rate in St. Lawrence County was 9.9% in 2022. That's almost 10 times the state average. And just one midwife handles most of the home births here. Lucy Grindon reports. This mother in Potsdam, Jen, has given birth to seven children. She still feels scared with each one. But since she moved to the North Country, she's been delivering with a local midwife, Sunday Smith. She knows me. She knows my name. And I trust her with everything in me. I call Jen when she's about to give birth to her seventh child. She asks me not to use her last name to maintain her family's privacy, but she says I can attend the birth. Less than 24 hours later, Sunday Smith texts me. Her message says, saddle up and ride. When I get to Jen's house 20 minutes later, the baby is already here. Smith kneels on the living room floor. She's pressed into the side of an inflatable birthing tub, her arms submerged in the warm water. She's showing the baby's older sister how to cut the umbilical cord. Uh, You're going to cut in between these two clamps, and I'll keep her arms and all the bits out of the way. And it's really chewy. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Soon, Smith asks everyone to make Jen a nest on the couch. Jen sits there, cradling the baby. She whispers to Smith. (coughs) Never gets old. Sunday Smith is one of the only certified midwives in the North Country who practices home birth. She used to spend days and nights crisscrossing the region in her car to meet every client at home. She still does home births, but in 2021, she opened her own birth center in Potsdam. It's one of the only freestanding birth centers in northern New York. She's very busy. I might have to go catch another baby, and she's Mennonite, and she would not appreciate someone else being there. She weighs Jen's baby before she goes. Oh, no. Yeah, last call on the way. 6.13. 8.6. And she rushes off to the birth center to catch the 500th baby she will have delivered in the North Country. People turn to Sunday Smith and to home birth midwives in general because they don't want to give birth in a hospital. 
Some people are determined to give birth at home because of fear, expense, or cultural tradition. Without home birth midwives, those people would give birth alone with no one to read potential danger signs. Desiree Greenwood is a birth doula who grew up in Morristown in Ogdensburg. She says the North Country desperately needs more midwives. A lot of women, especially in the North Country, don't have the ability to have autonomy over their own choices because there are no options. Greenwood herself is currently training as a midwife in Brooklyn. She plans to move back to the North Country once she's certified and work as a home birth midwife. One of her goals will be to provide care for people who don't currently have good access, like migrant farm workers. Regina Willette is a retired North Country midwife. She did home births here for decades. We need more midwives, especially midwives who are trained in community birth and cognizant of the Amish culture. Willette says the North Country's large Amish and Mennonite populations increase its home births. Both times I visited Sunday Smith's birth center, I saw families from those communities in the waiting room. Smith wants her services to be accessible. She gives a discount of more than 50% to Amish and Mennonite families. If they still can't pay her fee, she says they find a way to work something out. One client paid by building a brand new wooden deck for the birth center. And Smith takes clients with Medicaid. The reimbursements she gets aren't as large as the ones from private insurance companies, but she says she wouldn't feel right turning anyone away. That doesn't feel like service to me. That doesn't feel like access to me. That feels like I'm saying that this is a service for the wealthy. But what I believe is that it's it's a service for the healthy. Demand for Smith's services is high. So high that she sometimes worries she can't keep up. Last October, in one month, she delivered 16 babies. She wasn't getting enough sleep. At some point, I have to look at, okay, how many is so many that you aren't rested enough that you're not safe anymore? Not just is the person coming into my building, is she safe because she's low risk? Is she safe because I'm on my game? One reason there's so much demand is that some women believe that avoiding the hospital will make them less likely to have a C-section. That's the surgical procedure where a doctor cuts a mother open to deliver a baby. North Country hospitals do have higher than average C-section rates. For example, the rate at Claxton Hepburn Medical Center in Ogdensburg is 47 percent. That's 13 percent higher than the state average. The rate's only slightly above the state average at Canton Potsdam Hospital at 38 percent. C-sections are always worse than vaginal deliveries as a general thing. So it's something to be avoided and it's something to be utilized when appropriate. Dr. Mazen Abdullah became the head of Canton Potsdam Hospital's OBGYN department in 2018. Since then, he says the hospital has taken measures to reduce C-sections. But he says the C-section rate has a lot to do with location. CPH has become the main OBGYN unit for all of St. Lawrence County, the largest county in the state. And it's been serving more patients from farther away, outside St. Lawrence County, especially since the Alice Hyde Maternity Center in Malone closed in 2022. Some CPH patients have to drive hours through the snow to reach the hospital. That means they arrive in a later and sometimes riskier stage of labor. And the nearest high-level neonatal intensive care unit is in Syracuse, hours away by ambulance. So if Abdullah thinks a delivery might be going south, he's going to operate sooner rather than later because he knows a baby in poor condition won't make it to the NICU fast enough. Because the alternative is a disaster. A dead baby, a baby who's damaged permanently, um, or a mom that's damaged permanently, or mom's death versus my C-section rate is worse. Abdullah also says C-section rates are more influenced by the health of the population than by the decision-making of individual doctors. Here's an example. Dr. Abdullah sometimes helps out at Carthage Area Hospital, right by the Fort Drum Army Base. Their typical patient is young, healthy, athletic, eats well, not likely to be diabetic or have hypertension. In Carthage, his personal C-section rate is only half of what it is in Potsdam. Do I perform worse in Potsdam? Am I dumber in Potsdam? Do I have less experience in Potsdam? Obviously not. 
I actually have better staff in Potsdam, better facilities in Potsdam. I have better backup in Potsdam. But when I'm in Carthage, I have these young, strong women in the military that are like perfect health. Doctors' rates of doing C-sections are usually higher than midwives' rates of sending people to get C-sections. But Abdullah says that's mainly because midwives see healthier patients on average. But even the healthiest people can run into life-threatening complications. Earlier this month, one of Dr. Abdullah's patients had a placental abruption. She lost a liter of blood. And we did everything perfect. Now imagine if that's at somebody's home. A matter of minutes can be the difference between life and death. And Abdullah says it's always safer to have a doctor on hand. Canton Potsdam Hospital is just down the street from Sunday Smith's birthing center. And she does send clients there pretty often. I transfer about 12% of my people over to the hospital. And we, we don't call it a failed home birth. We call it smart utilization of local resources. Smith wants to keep expanding her practice, but she can't do it alone. She's waiting for more midwives to finish training and hoping they come to the North Country. In the meantime, she'll keep serving as many clients as she can herself. She says women come to her because she makes them feel safe. If what feels safe to you is all that technology and the bright lights and the multidisciplinary team, and the, if that's what feels safe to you, that's what you should do. But if what feels safe to you is soft lights, your your besties taking turns, rubbing your back, soft sounds, being able to move as your body guides you, if that's what feels safe to you, then that's what you choose. It's not that that one of these facilities is doing it right and the other was is doing it wrong. We're just serving the populations in the way that they want to be served. Smith personally feels that this is the work she was born to do. Lucy Grindon, North Country Public Radio. This is Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio, 12 minutes past 8. I'm Todd Moe. Just want to run through a list of schools closed today because of the weather. This is a list that is expanding as the morning progresses. Check it out online right now at ncpr.org. More of Northern Light in just a moment, but these schools are closed today because of slippery roads this morning. Ag Studies Academy in Canton, Ausable Valley, Beekmantown, Brazier Falls, Brushton Moira, Canton, Chateaugay, Colton Pierpont, Hammond, Huvelton, Lisbon, Little River in Canton, Mounted Waddington, Malone, Messina, Morristown, North Warren, Northern Adirondack, Nord Norfolk, Ogdensburg, Parrishville, Hopkinton, Peru, Plattsburgh, Potsdam, Salmon River, Saranac, Scroon Lake, Seaway Tech Center, Boses in Norwood, and St. Regis Falls Central School. <laughs> You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It's 813. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandresky. Coming up in just a few minutes, music and conversation with the electroacoustic duo Archive. That's in just a few minutes right here on Northern Light. Music by Patricia Julian in Burlington. Northern Light is supported by Adirondack Foundation and the Adirondack Birth to Three Alliance, dedicated to providing all children the best possible start in life. AdirondackBT3.org.
Emergency crews searched the water near Point Salubrious in the town of Lyme Wednesday night. According to WWNY-TV, they got a report that people were yelling near Cherry Island in a bay of eastern Lake Ontario. They found a large hole in the ice near some ice fishing shanties. Eventually, the owner of the shanties confirmed that no one was missing and crews called off the search. Chameau's fire chief said he'd like to see owners write their names and phone numbers on their shacks so search and rescue can call if there's a suspected accident. Emergency officials are warning the ice is very dangerous this winter, and they're urging people to take precautions before, during, and after heading out. Catherine Wheeler reports. It's the season for ice fishing and skating and snowmobiling, but because of the unseasonably mild weather and all of the freezing and thawing, the ice on rivers and lakes is very unstable and dangerous. So officials are warning people to be aware. We like to tell people that two inches or less to stay off the ice. That's Stephen Trenton with the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary. The auxiliary promotes recreational boating safety and performs search and rescue, along with other duties. Four inches is good for going out for ice fishing and a snowmobile or ATV. It's recommended for five inches for a small car or pickup, eight to 12 inches and for a medium sized truck, 12 to 15 inches. But Trenton says he wouldn't recommend taking a vehicle out on the ice because the thickness varies. He says the only way to know for sure how thick it is, is to drill into it. And for those who want to go out, Trenton says to remember the ICE acronym. I stands for information. Check the weather and ice conditions before heading out on your trip. Local bait shops will likely have updated reports. The C is clothing. Uh, Wear sufficient clothing to prevent hypothermia. Choose bright colors and reflective garments to aid searchers if you end up needing help. And E is for equipment. That means bringing along your compass in case of bad weather and a personal locator beacon so you can send a signal to first responders if something goes wrong. We always recommend a life jacket or a float coat and screwdrivers and ice picks, which may allow you to pull yourself out of the water should you break through the ice. Trenton says even walking on the ice comes with risk. He has a tip for that. We suggest that when you're on ice, and this may sound a little corny, that you walk like a penguin. Walk on the ice, keep your center of gravity over your front leg. Trenton says he strongly recommends not going on the ice without a buddy. But it's always important to tell someone where you're going and what time you're planning on returning, and to update them if plans change. That way they can notify EMS if you don't return by the agreed-upon time. Trenton says there have been fewer fatalities in recent years, but there are still tragic accidents. Over the weekend, a man was found dead in his truck after it fell through the ice on the St. Lawrence River near Clayton. He says the call they get the most now is for people whose dogs have fallen through the ice. Overall, Trenton says to play it safe and to make sure you get warm after to avoid hypothermia. Catherine Wheeler, North Country Public Radio. New York Senator Kirsten Gillibrand has proposed a bill to try to reduce food deserts. It would offer financial incentives to grocery stores to open in underserved areas through a USDA program. Gillibrand said food deserts are a big problem in some parts of New York. In rural areas like the North Country, many people live far away from the nearest grocery store. Gillibrand's bill would give $50 million a year to be used for grocery store loans and grants. She's also calling for an additional $25 million to be allocated to the program in this year's government funding bill. The village of Saranac Lake has decided to start getting all its electricity from a renewable source, a local hydropower company. The decision is part of a broader push after the village adopted the New York State Climate Smart Communities Pledge in 2018. Village board members unanimously voted to enter a contract with Northern Power and Light at a meeting earlier this month, according to a company press release. The hydropower company will come from the hydropower will come from its plants in Potsdam and St. Regis Falls. It'll cover the village's electricity needs for things like water treatment, public works, and the Mount Pisgah Recreation Center. The new agreement is expected to save the village twelve to fifteen thousand dollars a year. Saranac Lake Mayor Jimmy Williams said the decision was a no-brainer and that the village should have done it a long time ago. And Snowfest organizers in Boonville had to cancel this weekend's snowmobile races. They said in a Facebook post that there's not enough snow to form snowbanks. Without them, the ice oval can't be safe for racing, but they are hoping to reschedule if there's enough snow next month. Fingers crossed. Thank you.
listening to Northern Lights right here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandresky. Coming up in just a minute, we'll meet the classically trained Juilliard graduates pushing the edge of classical music. They've got a couple of shows in the Saranac Lake area this weekend. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note. We'll find out about the red-bellied woodpecker, wood, red-bellied woodpecker and its curious name. That's coming up at 842. At first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. Rain, freezing rain today. A lot of schools are closed. Check our website for that list, ncpr.org. School closings and delays because of the weather today. Maybe some snow showers through the weekend. Highs in the 30s today and again tomorrow. Uh, Sunday's highs around uh, around 30 with uh, some scattered snow showers Saturday and Sunday. Right now, freezing rain in Canton, 32 degrees. Violinist Jonathan Myron and cellist Philip Shegog use creativity, improvisation, and spontaneity in their music. Known as Archive, the young string duo from Manhattan brings its brand of electroacoustic music to Saranac Lake and Saranac this weekend in a series presented by Hill and Hollow Music. Jonathan Myron and Philip Shegog met a few years ago after finishing their studies at Juilliard. They were jamming at a party after a conference. It was just the two of them on violin and cello. They improvised for nearly two hours nonstop and found a creative link. Since then, they've performed at Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and the Met and venues around the country. They're in the Adirondacks this weekend, working with music students at Peru Central School and performing two concerts, Saturday night at Lake Flower Landing in Saranac Lake and Sunday afternoon at the Saranac Fire Hall. They told me they're really fired up about 2024 with lots of concerts lined up and a trip out to L.A. later this year to finish their debut album. So I asked Jonathan, what makes creating their own music so special? I think the moment that Philip and I heard the sound that we were creating together, we knew that it was different. We knew that something was there, and it was just a matter of manifesting that. We got together just a couple months later, and we had events lined up, and so we, it really like kind of forced us to, to figure things out quickly. What was maybe surprising to us was just how people responded to the music. I think, I, I, I think we, we both thought that something was there, but until you, we, you actually received feedback from people, you see how people respond, that's when it's, I think, a clear indicator uh, that there's something special. I think we had that those moments um, early on, and that really just put wood into the fire, essentially, and, and we, we, we've just run with it. that that Jonathan and I are both naturally voracious omnivores of music and we are very curious that's what led us both individually before we'd even met to be exploring musical styles outside of the classical tradition that we were studying at Juilliard and that sort of desire to just keep exploring and keep pushing the boundaries that's that's only increased as we have continued to work together and increase the tool set that we have at our disposal with which to create music. And I think that's always a, a driving force of ours is not, in essence, not to rest on the laurels of a sound that we've created, but always to be looking for what's next. And our, our music is one of synthesis. 
It's bringing together so many diverse elements and kind of shoving them together so that it pops up with something new. And so every time that we um, learn about a new subgenre of music or are inspired by an artist who we've just discovered, those are all ingredients that get added to the soup. And so in that way, I think our sound will never be static because we're always going to be responding to what we're hearing and what we're inspired by. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that and say that I, I truly believe that music is the language of the soul. It really showcases what is most fundamental to all of us and our individual life experiences. And so when we come to the table together and we start writing together, it is an encapsulation of all of our life experiences um, and all the things that, we, that we've absorbed, that all the things that make us who we are. And all the music that we listen to, because music really is our life, right? And so um, I think in that way, when Philip and I got together and we started making music together, it was a beautiful thing because we were creating music that really pushed beyond definition or genre. It It really was this thing that in many ways was universal and we were able to share it with so many people from from so many different cultures. and, And to us, I think that's the most powerful thing about what we do. really kind of a maybe a i don't know kind of a naive question but in one of your videos you're both playing these really cool futuristic electroacoustic violin and, and cello they look like something from star trek and then in other videos you're playing the the more sort of traditional instruments so glad you asked absolutely so as jonathan was mentioning from the very outset when we first started improvising and making music together Our music is often very intense, or not intense, but large Mm -hmm. in scope and scale. And there are other pieces of ours that you can find online right now that even more so are really pushing the acoustic instruments to the limits of what they can produce, which relies on a lot on our classical training, right? Playing all those concertos that are um, pulling on all four strings at the same time, right? That we were drawing from that technique in order to try to realize this larger-than-life sound with our acoustic violin and cello. What we discovered as we continued making music, though, is we started opening ourselves up to what would happen if we started using different tools to create our music. And so the instruments that you're referring to are the electric violin and the electric cello. And when we started experimenting with those instruments and with more production, right, um, using the, the tools of technology and our computers to be tools with us in making the music, that was opening Pandora's box for us and is now an invaluable tool that we use in almost every single composition that we write. It's, in, it's embedded into our creative process. And for, the, for listeners who come out to the concerts, you will be hearing pieces on both acoustic and electric violin and cello. And the sound worlds that we were able to create are vast. And the variety of sound and emotions and journeys that we can take people on has just increased with these new instruments. And so we we have a lot of fun taking the acoustics and pushing them in ways that people haven't heard before. And an 